Welcome. Uh, as most of you know, I'm Craig Snyder, the President of the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia. Uh, I'm going to start with our obligatory announcements. Uh, ask you to silence your cell phones and other electronic devices if you haven't already done so. Uh, however, uh, again, as always, uh, we encourage you to tweet after our speaker's remarks, uh, your comments, your views about the program, and we also, of course, invite you to like the World Affairs Council on Facebook. We have a couple more exciting events planned for the remainder of 2015, and we have, of course, already started uh, planning for 2016. Ask if you would mark your calendars, if you haven't done so already, for this coming Monday, uh, the 23rd, uh, at uh, which, at lunchtime, uh, when the council will be joined uh, by the co-author of the Pew Center Report on Global Attitudes and Trends who will discuss attitudes towards uh, the United States and our global role. A topic that I think uh, was timely when we planned it, maybe even more timely now, as the debate about our global role intensifies. It's important to know how that is viewed around the world. Uh, and then don't miss, uh, please, our last event of the calendar year, an evening with Peggy Noonan uh, for Tuesday, December the 1st. As a Wall Street Journal columnist, uh, a former Reagan special assistant, speechwriter uh, and the author of uh, The Time of Our Lives, Peggy Noonan, will take us through her remarkable career and how she became one of the most influential voices uh, in our country. Uh, coming in 2016, uh, on Monday, January 25th, uh, is another author, Robert Boynton, who will delve into the topic of his new book, a topic that we don't hear much about, but I think uh, holds a lot of fascination when uh, when it is broached, and that is the North Korean kidnappings of Japanese citizens that took place in the 1970s and 80s. Finally, uh, as we uh, begin tonight, uh, our thoughts uh, are, uh, of course, uh, with uh, the people of France and all the other victims of terrorism uh, throughout the world. We're going to be addressing uh, questions surrounding uh, Islam uh, and extremism uh, and terrorism in a series uh, launching on April 12th. The first installment of the series will feature Mark Grossman, uh, former United States Ambassador to Turkey, and former United States Special Envoy, and Envoy to Pakistan and Afghanistan. And Joby Warwick, the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author of Black Flags, The Rise of ISIS. So please uh, mark your calendars again for that important discussion, which will, as I say, begin a series on those topics. These events, uh, that you are kind enough to attend, and the Council's Citizen Diplomacy Trips, along with all of the support of our uh, members and corporate partners, directly enable the Council to conduct its most important programs, which are those we hold for a diverse group of over 2,000 middle and high school students in over 90 schools throughout the Philadelphia area, programs which foster the skills and sensibilities that our next generation will need in order to thrive and compete in the knowledge-based and competitive global economy. Now to introduce tonight's program, I would like to introduce to you Council Board Member Tim Gillespie. Tim is the President for the Mid-Atlantic Region for Wilmington Trust, an M&T banking company, which is generously supporting tonight's event. Please join me in welcoming Tim Gillespie. seemingly not at the forefront of our national security priorities. 
With the ever-developing world of technology, coupled with the infinite possibilities presented through cyberspace, hackers are finding ways to target our nation's transportation, communication, and power systems. A major hit to any of these systems could be as devastating as a nuclear bomb. The likelihood of, it, of such an occurrence can raise numerous questions. Can such an overwhelming cyber, cyber attack be prevented? If so, how can it be prevented? If a cyber attack were to strike the US, crippling our systems, what would we do to survive it? Here with us tonight to discuss such questions is journalist and author Ted Koppel. He is a veteran news anchor, having had a 42-year career at ABC News, 25 years of which were spent as the anchor and managing editor of ABC News Nightline. Many of us here tonight recall, well, Ted hosting Nightline's coverage of the 444-day Iranian hostage crisis in the early 1980s. We also recall the wonderful interviews that Ted conducted with individuals such as Mary Schwartz, a retired professor from Brandeis University and the subject of the best-selling novel, Tuesdays with Maury. Ted Koppel has won every significant television award there is including eight Peabody Awards, 42 Emmy Awards. Recently, New York University has named him as one of the top 100 American journalists of the past 100 years. His latest project is his book, Lights Out. Please join me in welcoming Ted Koppel. may well be deterred in the way that 
nuclear states have been deterred uh, by the fear of retaliation. Uh, and the non-state actors, like ISIS, uh, may not possess the sophistication to do this, um, at least not in a time frame uh, that doesn't allow us to be able to be more sophisticated and to, and to prevent it. So my question is, is there a, is there a silver lining in this dark cloud? Uh, well, you, you have very skillfully summed up the first half of the book. <laughs> First of all, I think the point needs to be made that there is a tendency among people to believe that the kind of balance of terror that has existed in the nuclear world between the Soviet Union and the United States would be sufficient, I mean the, the notion of mutual assured destruction, would be sufficient to defer any nation state from launching a cyber attack against the United States. The problem with that logic is it doesn't work. The problem with that logic is uh, when a, in the event of a Soviet missile attack against the United States, uh, NORAD would have known within a matter of seconds where the attack was coming from. The president would have been informed of that immediately. He would have had 27, 28 minutes in which to reach a decision as to whether to wait for the missiles to land and then respond, or whether to respond immediately. But there would have been no doubt in his mind as to the origin of the attack. I, I, I turn your attention only to the recent North Korean attack on Sony Pictures, uh, which was devastating to Sony Pictures. But the fact of the matter is they had, they had just released this goofy movie about the North Korean dictator. It was clear that the North Korean dictator was less than flattered by the man that was uh, And I think any high school student could have figured out in a matter of minutes that the attack on Sony probably came from North Korea. Nevertheless, it took the FBI months. <laughs> no, I'm not mocking the FBI. You know, you can jump to a conclusion, but it doesn't mean that you have proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that the North Koreans launched the attack. It took the FBI months to come to the conclusion that indeed it had been the North Koreans. What are you going to do if a cyber attack is launched against the American power grid or any part of the U.S. infrastructure. And the president then calls a meeting of, of his top staff and they're in the situation room and he turns to the director of the NSA and the DCI, the uh, director of central intelligence, and he says, all right, who did it? And he says, sir, uh, we think the attack came from Ukraine. Really? from Ukraine. Do we think the Ukrainians launched the attack? Well, sir, we don't know. In fact, we can't even say for sure that the attack originated in Ukraine because as we track it back, it looks as though before it came from Ukraine, it may have come from Buenos Aires. Indeed, before it came from Buenos Aires, it may have come from Durban in South Africa. And before there, it came from Helsinki. And before Helsinki, in fact, tracking it back, sir, it looks as though the attack originated in Brooklyn. <laughs> now what do you do? What does the president do? In other words, responding to a devastating cyber attack requires, first of all, knowing where the attack originated. We may not be able to determine that for months. That's a problem. But what you say in, in sort of listing the dangerous nations and, and bodies out there is absolutely correct. The Chinese, the Russians have the greatest cyber capability in terms of those among our adversaries. We believe, however, 
that they are unlikely to launch a cyber attack against the United States because we have so many interlocking interests with them that ultimately it would not be to their advantage to do that. As you go down the list of, of cyber capable people, Craig, you come up with the Iranians. They're probably just behind the Russians and the Chinese may already have the capability, may already be inside our grid. Are they going to do it? No, probably not. Just behind them in capability, the North Koreans. Now you're starting to get into dangerous territory because the North Koreans are unpredictable. They are likely to do something that could be devastating both to us and to them. But again, remember, you don't know right away who did it. And behind the North Koreans, that's when you get them to folks, and I suppose this takes us inevitably to what just happened in Paris. People like ISIS. There are already those in US intelligence who believe that ISIS is very close, if not already having the capacity to launch a cyber attack against our Think about the nature of terrorism. Terrorism is, after all, the weapon of the weak. Terrorism is used by organizations and has been used for more than 100 years by organizations that do not have their own air force, don't have their own army, don't have their own navy. Now, in a manner of speaking, they do. Having a cyber capability means that you can launch an anonymous attack from almost anywhere in the world. And if your primary goal is inflicting pain and suffering, this is a way to do it. So do I think it's likely that ISIS will do something like that? If and when they get the capacity to do it, yes. And I don't think they're that far away from going. You devote uh, three chapters in the book uh, to discussing uh, the Mormons uh, and uh, their, their doctrinal and their historical push for extraordinary disaster preparedness. Is there a model uh, for the rest of the nation uh, in what the, the, the Church of Latter-day Saints has done? Uh, and, and if so, if you think there is, how does one extrapolate from a largely rural uh, population to, to the big city? Uh, again, you've raised a number of interesting questions. Um, can individuals follow the, the Mormon example within limits? I mean, the, the Mormons who've been kicked from pillar to post in this country for the better part of 200 years began in New York, moved to Pennsylvania, Ohio, Missouri, Illinois. In Illinois, at one point, they had a city called Nauvoo, which was the size of Chicago, a gigantic city at the time. And Joseph Smith, the founder of the, of the Church of Latter-day Saints, Joseph Smith was not only the, the titular head of the city, he had his own National Guard, in effect. He had troops. His brother, his younger brother Hiram, would have been his successor, but both men were arrested and assassinated. And then it was Brigham Young who led the remaining Mormons across the country to Salt Lake City. And he picked Salt, well, it wasn't a city, to the Great Salt Lake. And he picked the Great Salt Lake precisely because he thought that nobody else would ever want to live there. Uh, and so the, the Mormons have a history of surviving disaster, a history of being prepared for disaster, and they have been encouraged to this day to be ready for the worst that can happen. So that you've got in Mormon families, Mormon families are encouraged to have a three to six months. Is that it? <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the Mormons are encouraged. 
workers to have a three to six month supply of food, water, some extra money, medicine at home. Uh, so you have this organization that is built from the ground up, but also a massive structure that is created from the top down. Uh, out in Salt Lake City, for example, there are warehouses that would put Costco and Walmart to shame. <laughs> they have thousands of acres of farmland where they, they grow food for people, but also uh, feed for thousands upon thousands of cattle and heifers. They have factories for the production of cheese and pasta and meat, uh, canning facilities, a trucking company of their own, the Deseret Trucking Company. At one, at one of these warehouses alone, they have a backlog of 250,000 gallons of diesel fuel, which will take care of emergency generators and the trucking company for quite a while. Is that something that we can easily emulate? Not really. But there is an example there that I think is worth reading about, and that's why I spent so much time on it. Uh, I think there are things that we as individuals can do. This looks to be a fairly prosperous crowd. And, and look at it this way, if those of us among us who can afford it were to set aside a three-month supply of food and keep rotating that on a regular basis, then in the event of a national crisis such as the one that I, that I described, uh, if in fact the federal government were prepared to take care of those who these days have trouble putting a meal on the table every day, the likelihood of more people being able to survive it would be enhanced. For those who haven't had a chance to read the book, can you, can you take us through the, the, the description that you give of how a power, a long-term power failure unfolds and results in, in mass capital? Well, um, I assume that all of you have experienced a problem of one kind or another, uh, whether it lasts a matter of hours or whether it lasts a matter of days, uh, you pretty quickly come to realize how dependent we all are on electricity. If something like this were to happen in a city like Philadelphia, or Chicago, or New York, uh, food supplies would tend to run out in a matter of days. Remember now, the trucking companies that would be bringing food in rely on being able to get fuel so that they can move the trucks. Most of the gas stations after Superstorm Sandy were found to have plenty of gas in the ground, but they didn't have emergency generators. So they couldn't pump the gas out of the ground. Food is going to start running out in a matter of two to three days in a city like New York or Philadelphia. No electricity, you have no light, you have no heat, you have no cooling in the summer, no heating in the winter. Uh, your refrigerator will stop functioning, as will your freezer. Uh, the worst part is likely to be the fact that your water taps are not going to produce water. Without water, your toilets will not flood. In a city the size of New York, 8 million people producing human waste on a daily basis and no ability to get rid of that waste, you're going to have a massive health crisis on your hands in no time. The likelihood that a city like New York has a, a backlog of more than two or three days food, not great. I spoke to the head of, of uh, Homeland Security for the state of New York and said, what do you do in the event of a crisis like this? How much emergency food do you have? Oh, he said, we've got 25 million MREs, meals ready to eat. I said, 25 million? Wow. You've got 8 million people in New York City alone. So that's three meals for the citizens of New York. That's not counting any of the other people in New York State. What do you do after three days? He said, after three days, we're in trouble. 
So um, I don't need to sketch out for you. You can all imagine how things would be without electricity by the end of the first week. Perhaps even by the end of the second week. But you're rapidly going to reach a situation in which people are going to be confronted by the question of, we can't stay, but where are we going to go? <coughs> if much of the entire East Coast is without electricity, if the gas stations aren't pumping gas, how far are you going to get, those of you who even have a full tank of gas in your car? And how confident are you when you get to where you're going that unless you have a great deal of cash with you, because remember, you're not going to be able to withdraw money from the bank, you're not going to be able to go to a cash machine, you're not going to be able to get whatever cash you've got is the cash you've got. That's it. And now as you head out of town and you start moving west from New York or from Philadelphia. Where are you going? And how confident are you of a welcome when you get there? I read about one state, and I deliberately do not name the state because the person who told me is afraid that the governor will know who, who it was who gave me the information and fire this person so I don't even identify him or her by gender. But this person told me that in this particular state, which is a rural state, the governor had made a plan with his National Guard, with his various sheriff's department, with the state police, that if there were a major crisis in a nearby city and tens of thousands of refugees come down, that his police and National Guard would be standing there with bottles of water, a sandwich, and a map. The map would take them to the nearest working gas station. But they would be told, we're terribly sorry. We do not have the infrastructure to handle it. If you want to get even an impression of what it might be like, look at those pictures of the refugees from North Africa and Syria and Libya pouring into Western Europe. That's what we're confronting. So what I'm talking about is the need for us to begin a national dialogue. The need for us to consider this as being one of those rare topics that should not be partisan. This shouldn't be an issue between Democrats and Republicans or conservatives and liberals. We're talking here about issues of survival. We have not yet begun to do that. On a national basis. What better time to begin than at the beginning of the presidential campaign? Thus far, I have yet to hear one of the presidential candidates talk. You do uh, go in, in the book in, into detail about different policy proposals for how to minimize this risk uh, and how to prepare for the risk at the same time as best as possible. Having done all this work, what is your favorite policy response? If you were the President of the United States or even the King of the World, what would you do to deal with the threat that you've described? I would resign. <laughs> I'm not sure I quite accept the first part of your question uh, in that I don't believe that there is any policy that can be implemented relatively quickly that can protect us against this kind of attack. The internet was never designed to be defended. That's the problem. Let me, let me just sort of indulge in a little bit of wonkiness here for a couple of minutes and tell you what the, what the electric power grid is really like, why it is so dependent upon the internet. I want you to imagine, this is a, an inadequate analog, but it's the best I can do. I want you to imagine a gigantic balloon that has a thousand valves, 
500 of those valves permit air to be introduced into the balloon. The other 500 valves take air out of the balloon. As long as you bring air in and take air out at precisely the same rate, the balloon remains perfectly inflated. Put too much air in, the balloon bursts. Take too much air out, the balloon collapses. Our electric power grid is made up of 3,200 different companies. It is totally dependent on the generation of electricity remaining balanced with the use of electricity. Generate more electricity than you're taking out, you're going to start collapsing the system. Take more out than you've got coming in, you're going to start collapsing the system. 3,200 companies that have to be kept in perfect balance. Only the internet is capable of doing that. There are systems, so-called SCADA systems, supervisory control and data acquisition systems that maintain that perfect balance. As I said a few moments ago, Greg, the Chinese and the Russians are already in those SCADA systems. They have, they have planted what amount to cyber landmines that could be activated at any time. Lest you wonder if we have the same capability and have done the same thing to the Russians and the Chinese, absolutely. Our offensive cyber capability is second to none. Our defensive cyber capability is totally lacking. Uh, and, and is it possible? The, the electric power companies will tell you we've got all kinds of protections in place. We have all kinds of resiliency. Uh, they, will, they will maintain that they have uh, defense mechanisms that, in effect, air gap one system from another, so that it is impossible for a cyber attack to get through. And when you raise, however, the possibility that one of their workers, one of their employees, may take a thumb drive home with him or her, plug it into their own computer at home, where it becomes infected, and then bring that infected thumb drive back to work the next day, they say, well, that's a possibility. Can happen. There is a reason why we use so many terms borrowed from medicine in talking about the internet. We talk about a program being infected. We talk about a virus infecting the program. Uh, I draw an analogy in the book to what happened with the, the Ebola virus, where this man came from West Africa, landed in Texas, was already carrying the Ebola virus, was hospitalized, cared for by two special care, emergency care nurses, who were as well protected as they could possibly be. Headgear, plastic visor, two uniforms, two sets of gloves, booties, both of them caught the disease. Because it was speculated later Either the patient had been in the final stages of Ebola, projectile vomiting, terrible diarrhea, either they got a little splash where there was just a, a spot of this fecal matter or vomit that, that got them on the neck, or that when they took their gloves off, they were careless and touched the outside of the glove and were infected that way. The, the cyber equivalent to that is called an attack surface. It doesn't have to be very big. The tiniest surface allows an attacker to get in. Uh, I, I did a program yesterday morning with General Keith Alexander, who was the, the, uh, the head of the NSA. Uh, and General Alexander put it this way, there are only two kinds of companies in the United States today. Those who have been hacked, and those who don't yet know it. The vault of the All of those companies, in fact, the average length of time that it takes a company to discover that it has been hacked, 279 days, almost a year. 
and usually they're told by someone on the outside. What can happen to our private companies? What has happened, I mean, you're probably all familiar with the story of the, the Chinese vacuuming up 22.1 million personnel records of federal employees, including employees of the FBI, the CIA, the Defense Department, the State Department, the White House. 22.1 million. I mean, it is the biggest intelligence hall in history. It would be naive of us to believe that the vulnerabilities that apply to private industry, the vulnerabilities that apply to our government agencies, the vulnerabilities that apply across the board simply do not exist in one area, our infrastructure. It's not true. We have uh, just a minute left before we open to questions from the audience. Sure. I wonder if you'll uh, indulge me uh, one question that's, that's not about the book. Of course. Um, in your work in the uh, Iranian hostage crisis and in uh, all the years of Nightline that followed, uh, you really are one of the inventors of modern uh, television news. Uh, I wonder as you now look at uh, the current landscape of television news, what you think of, of, of what you helped create. Uh, where, where do you think the strengths are, and where do you think the weaknesses are that, that, that could be improved for the benefit of our public? It's a totally different landscape. Um, when I first joined ABC News in 1963, there were three networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS. There was no cable, there was no satellite. Uh, when I was in Vietnam covering the war over there in 1967, we still used film. It would be, I mean, literally that film had to be shipped from the battlefield to Saigon, from Saigon to Tokyo, from Tokyo to Los Angeles, LA to New York, motorcycle courier took it in, it had to be put into a, a uh, you know, processing lab, and two and a half to three days after I had written the report and the cameraman had shot his video, it would go on the air. These days, everything instantaneous. These days, not three outlets, <coughs> 3,000, 30,000. If you add all the cable outlets, all of the satellite outlets, all the internet outlets, right? And, and the difference, therefore, is that the level of competition is so much greater than it was even at the most competitive days among ABC, NBC, CBS, but also the deregulation of things has not helped in that we, our, our bosses at ABC and NBC and CBS, were actually concerned about having the license suspended or maybe even taken away if they did not, among other things, provide operate, in, and this is a phrase taken right out of the FCC handbook, they had to operate in public interest, necessity, and convenience. That meant make all the money you want from I Love Lucy, make all the money you want from 77 Sunset Strip, but you've got to produce a decent news product. So it was that in the late 1960s, in the early 70s, when I was a foreign correspondent, I was one of 35 foreign correspondents of ABC News. CBS and NBC had even more. So the three networks alone, you had more than 100 foreign correspondents based overseas, telling you what was happening overseas. Listen to television tomorrow night and tell me how many American accents you hear. You'll hear Brits, you'll hear Australians, you'll hear Canadians, You'll hear folks from South Africa, New Zealand, very, very few American correspondents overseas. ABC these days, I think, has five foreign correspondents. Makes a difference. Back then, we were committed to giving you the news we thought you needed to know. These days, the networks are in competition to give you the news they think you want. So that's why. You get an awful lot of news on weather. You get an awful lot of Q 
cute animal stories. <laughs> and of course, our main diet these days is the Kardashian effect. <laughs> I'd like to open for questions from the audience. We have a microphone here if people would approach so we can all hear your question. Thank you for coming, by the way. Thank you. Uh, I'm getting probably 35 years ahead of myself, but just imagine for a minute that, that the United States got most of its electricity, uh, generated most of its electricity by solar. Would you expect whenever that day comes that most of that electricity will be generated in solar farms, which would mean yes grid, yes disasters you're describing, potential disasters you're describing, were generated on the premises, which would mean, I think, no grid, and, and, and that's at least with regard to that, uh, much less chance of, of the disasters you're describing. Well, I think you're still going to have the, the, the grid for the most part. There are micro grids around the country, mostly in rural areas. I'm not sure, uh, I mean, first of all, what you're talking about, you're quite right. Uh, maybe it's not 35 years in the future, but uh, you know, the notion that anything like this can be put into, can be put into effect in less than 15 or 20 years, uh, I think is pretty slight. But I'm, I'm ready to be shocked and surprised. The issue is not so much the generation of power. Whether the power is generated by nuclear, or whether it's generated by coal, or whether it's generated by solar, or whether it's generated by some other means, you still have to have the means of transmitting it across the country. You still have to be able to download it when it gets there. You're still going to need those, those giant transformers that take power from the generation plant, right? And then step up the power so that it can be sent across country on those high power wires at maximum speed. And then you need giant transformers at the other end that step down the power so that it can be delivered to your home. If I told you that there are tens of thousands of those giant transformers, that they are on average 38 to 40 years old, that they weigh from 40 to 60,000 pounds, that each one is custom made. So if one goes down, you can't simply replace it with another, and that they are not, for the most part, manufactured in this country. Most of them are manufactured overseas. And if you order one today, it'll be one to two years before you get delivery, you begin to have a sense of the scope of the problem. It's not just the grid. Our whole, I mean, as with our bridges, as with our highways, as with so much of our infrastructure, the grid is, in many respects, old, outdated, and problematic. Yes, people are trying to come up with solutions and alternatives, but they're going to take years. Thank you very much.
perhaps that's not the correct term, but to utilize uh, cyber attacks as a mechanism by which to achieve something for the better good. You mentioned the United States is on, on equal probably uh, in regards to their ability to do that, but there are a lot of other countries that also can utilize that technology. Is there a scenario that you could envision that could achieve for the uh, result of the better good within the world now, utilizing this as an offensive or an offensive tool? How would that manifest itself? I don't think that you can really answer a question like that based on whatever the new weapon system may be. Whether we've been fighting one another with clubs or bows and arrows or rifles or bombs or uh, in, in more recent times the threat of, of nuclear bombs, I don't think the issue has ever been what kind of a weapon we're going to use. The problem these days is that we have enemies out there who don't necessarily seek to conquer the United States. They just want to hurt us. They want to inflict maximum damage. ISIS is a perfect example of that. And there are, ISIS is said to have $2 billion. With $2 billion, you can buy a lot of expertise on I'm not suggesting that the people who are now in ISIS are necessarily skilled hackers. But if you pay folks enough, you can buy a skilled hacker. And the kind of equipment that is needed to bring down a grid, for example, is available off the shelf. It's not specialized. Yes, sir. I've been teaching a cyber course for a few years now. And one of the things I keep talking about is the grid might be very well protected, but we keep buying things like Fitbits and baby monitors that are hooked up to the internet and therefore they are hackable. And it's those things that we're ignoring, but those things which can lead to, I think, can lead to these things. What do we do about a population that wants conveniences, even though they're dangerous? It's, uh, I draw an analogy in the book to what happened little over 100 years ago in this country. There was a wonderful invention. And that wonderful invention was going to make transportation and travel infinitely easier than it had ever been in the history of the mankind. And I sort of wonder about what if someone had told the leaders of our cities and the states and indeed the nation you know, one day in about 60 or 70 years, this new invention of yours, this wonderful invention, is going to kill 50,000 Americans, men, women, and children, every single year. I'm speaking, of course, about the automobile. The automobile you know, has so many virtues to this day. There are so many things we need from the automobile and the truck and the motorcycle and the van, right? That even though we're talking about, and we brought that number down, we only kill 25,000 of one another on our highways every year. Can you imagine if it were put up to a plebiscite what the vote would be? You think there's a snowball's chance in hell that Americans will say, you know, you're right. We ought to save 25,000 lives a year. Let's do away with the automobile. That's kind of where we are right now well, with the internet. But how about the spoon that tells you you're eating too fast? Yeah. Do we really need a spoon that tells you you're eating too fast and can be hacked? Don't buy it. <laughs> now, look, I was in a hotel in Chicago the other day. A beautiful hotel, beautiful room. And everything I could control from a little screen, right, on a desk or by my bed. Everything. I could order, you know, I could order room service from the screen. I could turn the television, get my channel from the screen. I could raise the heat, lower the heat in the room. 
Those systems are imminently hackable. And what one hacker, there's something called a Black Hat Conference, which is a conference of young hackers that usually takes place every year in Las Vegas. And one of these hackers gave a speech on precisely this system, making the point that someone sitting in Shanghai could, on a, on a night when it's 23 degrees in Chicago, turn the air conditioning up in every one of the rooms in that hotel I was staying in. Turn the television sets on and the sound so loud that people start screaming into the phone, I, you know, I can't turn the TV off. It's freezing cold, there's noise, the lights are going on and off, on and off, on and off, and now you have hundreds of guests streaming into the lobby wanting to know what the hell is going on. You want to know what an attack surface is? That's an attack surface. It doesn't really serve any particularly valid point, but if you can imagine that, you can also imagine how people will get into the power grid. Same kind of system. Yes, Two quick questions. We all hear the DPP for the Emergency Broadcasting Network or the Emergency Broadcasting Station. In your opinion, what would happen to that if they had power problem? Well, first, first of all, it would stop beeping. <laughs> <laughs> if the power is out, your television isn't going to work. Right? So, what good is the system? Well, if you have, look, I, I spent a frustrating hour with the current Secretary of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson, in which I said, what's the plan? You know, I mean, he had conceded, as have, have spoken to every Secretary of Homeland Security going back to the first. And they all concede that an attack on the power grid is not only a possibility, it's a likelihood. So I said to Jay Johnson, what's the plan? Well, what do you mean? So, you know, my, my 18 year old kid would know that you have to have a radio with batteries. I said, so wait a second, we're talking here about the possibility of a cyber attack that would knock out the power for tens of millions of people over a period of months, and you're telling me I need to have a radio with fresh batteries. <laughs> what exactly are you going to tell me on my radio with fresh batteries <laughs> that you can't tell me now? And wouldn't it be wiser to tell the American public what the plan is? And if you don't have a plan, why don't you come up with one? Right? We did not part on the desk of service. <laughs> a second quick question. If you were to go to the supermarket now and stock up on food, how many days of food would you have? Well, I wouldn't. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you what I have done. I have ordered a three months worth of freeze dried food which has to be reconstituted with water, requires some kind of a heating device. Uh, but at least that would enable my wife and me, and I also bought it for my children and grandchildren, uh, at least it'll, it'll allow them to survive for a couple of three months. And hopefully by then, either we will have found another place to go to, or there will be a solution. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, civil military relations in this field, because it seems that the Defense Department and the government agencies have recognized that they need to do a better job tapping into our expertise in Silicon Valley and in other tech communities in the United States. And we've seen a lot of uh, big officials go to Silicon Valley and make big speeches, but in, uh, when I've gone to Silicon Valley and spoken with people and companies, they say, we know who they are. We know that the military wants our expertise, but we, we don't really look very favorably on the government and on the military. And that seems to be a big problem. It does. Um, and and uh, look, what, what is ultimately, I said at the outset, this shouldn't be a partisan issue. This shouldn't be a liberal conservative issue. You put your finger on the one area where it's going. And that is in terms of privacy on the one hand versus security on the other. Uh, you now have stories coming out of France 
that the, the terrorists there who, who committed the, the terrible atrocity probably communicated over devices that were using apps that cannot be cracked by the police or the FBI or the CIA or European, uh, European security. Uh, and as you know, companies like Google and Amazon are adamantly insisting that they be permitted to have these kinds of devices and that the government not be given access to them. There is a certain level of hypocrisy among our friends out in Silicon Valley. Google and Amazon, for example, are perfectly happy to sell our private information that they get from our laptops and sell them to commercial companies out there, which then know Koppel reads the following. Right? These are the kinds of books that he reads. So, you know, when Amazon is putting a little ads on my on my screen, they already know I love John the Parade. Whether there's a new John, harmless. But is it harmless if someone has a terrible disease or a psychological problem and they have gone online to find certain answers about that psychological problem? And the next thing they know, they are getting inquiries from drug companies or even from psychiatric institutions saying, we understand you have someone in the family who's got, you know, we don't worry about that kind of violation of privacy. And I must tell you, quite frankly, when we are confronting a massive security problem, such as the one that I've tried to outline for you, if I have to choose between having the NSA gain access to my private information, or having Chinese intelligence, or Iranian intelligence, or Russian intelligence, I'll pick the NSA any day. But this is going to be a, it's going to be a battle. Isabel asked a question. Okay. Um, you shared our vulnerability and our awareness of such. Why hasn't it happened yet? Well, as I said, because those that are capable of doing it are least likely to do it because of the, the web of interrelationships that we have with them. And those might most likely to do don't yet have the capability. So really, it's only a question of how long it's going to be before nation states like North Korea have the capability, or before an independent group like ISIS, which has absolutely no concerns about inflicting harm and no particular worries about being uncovered or discovered before they get the capability. That's why I'm saying it's just a matter of time. So there are no intermediate groups in between for the moment. Well, there, there are intermediate groups. I, I would put Iran into that intermediate group. I would put Syria and North Korea. I mean, did you know, for example, that the Syrians hacked into American banks at precisely the time that President Obama was considering whether to launch an attack? I've been told by the former chief scientist of NSA that it's his conclusion that this was Assad's way of saying to President Obama and the White House, Careful what you do, we have the capacity to cause you enormous discomfort on Wall Street. So, yes, there are capabilities out there that, for one reason or another, haven't been implemented yet. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Last question. So, I actually want to build on the previous question. As I understand it, there are only two known examples. One was a Department of Energy uh, demonstration of the ability to have a, a generator self destruct and then perhaps the Stuxnet virus, uh, which was allegedly an Israeli-US operation that spun Iranian centrifuges out of control. So those are the only two examples we have where you go beyond the computer to have a, a physical effect in the real world. Well, and they're, I, no, they're not. They're just not. I'm sorry, you're, you're misinformed. There have been instances where the North Koreans have not South Korean television broadcasting off the air for more than a week. So I, I'm talking about instances I'm of the Russians uh, inflicting enormous damage on Georgia, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the nation of Georgia. Uh, there are instances in the wake of Stuxnet, for example, when the Iranians responded by taking out 30,000 computers at Aramco in Saudi Arabia. 
So if I could, if I just did the nuance was that Saudi Aramco, the Shamoon virus, it destroyed the computers, but it didn't destroy the oil production of the refiners. So just to get to my point, which is, I agree that we need to focus on security for industrial control systems, but doesn't, for example, the attack on the 35,000 computers of Saudi Aramco suggest that the IT problem, that, the, that some what people seem to be maybe more worried about is that you convince the operators of the power grid or the operators of the civilian nuclear power facility that something's going wrong, and they do the damage for you. In some sense, don't we need to marry up the, the threat, not just to the SCADA systems, which I think needs to be focused on, but that sometimes you can actually, through a more, an easier hack on, on, it, on the information technology itself, get some people to do your dirty work for you, which is what effectively happened in, in the sense, Saudi Aramco had lots of protections on their SCADA systems uh, and their oil refineries and the like. And what they fell down to was their window-based um, you know, systems were what went down and took them out. Um, I don't know. I can only speculate on what the Iranians were trying to do. My assumption is that what they were trying to do, they didn't respond against an Israeli target. They didn't respond against the U.S. target. And they didn't, as you correctly point out, go after the actual infrastructure of Aramco. I think what they were doing was sending a message. And they were sending a message by hitting a nation that they despise, which is a largely Sunni Arab nation, uh, which has a close association with the United States. And I think they were sending a message to us saying, be careful. You've opened up a Pandora's box here by, by attacking our centrifuges. Uh, and, and to those of you who don't know, let me just take a minute, the gentleman raises uh, a fascinating case. The Stuxnet attack, what, what we, uh, the NSA and the Israelis, succeeded in doing was not really causing the centrifuges in the towns, which spin nuclear fuel, to spin out of control so that we set the Iranian nuclear program back by about a year and a half. What we did at the same time was we managed to, on their control board, where they had television screens showing the functioning of those centrifuges, we managed in something straight out of Ocean's 11 to put a video up there that showed those centrifuges functioning perfectly. So that the Iranian technicians at the control board were sitting there saying, everything a-okay here. Meanwhile, they were spinning out of control and setting the program back by maybe a year and a half. We opened up the cyber war Pandora's box, just as 70 years ago we opened up the nuclear Pandora's box with our atomic attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And just as we have spent the past 70 years trying to put that nuclear genie back into the bottle of them, so we are now faced with the, the enormous crisis of trying to put that cyber genie back and you may be right, but I don't think so. Fitting conclusion. Ted, thank you so much for being here.